Um, I'm Tessie Mozafar. I'm um, a professor of neurology at University of California, Irvine. Um, and I have been a board member for, this is my second time on the board. So I've done my initial six months tenure and they brought me back. So, but our, our clinic in Irvine sees a lot of uh, myositis patients. We tend to see a, a lot of IBM, but a lot of dermatomyositis um, and, and necrotizing myopathy. And just for disclaimer purposes, I'm not a huge believer in polymyositis and I probably will be taken to task for that. Um, but my usual stance is if you have been diagnosed with polymyositis, you either have necrotizing myopathy or, or IBM, probably not polymyositis. Uh, at least I would encourage you to question that diagnosis, uh, and per se, especially if you're around 50 or higher. Um, what the task that I was given today was to talk about uh, lung and heart complications uh, in, um, in these diseases. Um, the first fundamental principle is that your diaphragm muscle, which is the main muscle of breathing, so diaphragm is the thin strip of muscle that divides the abdomen from the chest, and that's your primary muscle of breathing. And it's a muscle. So like any other muscle, diaphragm can get affected. Okay? So that's the first rule that you have to think about. The second rule is your heart muscle, even though the heart muscle is supposed to be morphologically different from skeletal muscle, it is after all a muscle. Okay? And there are conditions within the myositis family where the heart muscle may also get involved. Okay, so that's the second issue. The third issue that I want you to think about is the lung substance itself, the lung, um, the airways in the lung or the parenchyma of the lung can be infiltrated by the same immune cells that are affecting your muscle. Okay, so complications such as interstitial lung disease or whether you want to call it interstitial pneumonitis, there are different terms that we use is incredibly high in certain forms of myositis. And there are antibodies that may predict that you are likely to have that complication and therefore you need to be watched like a hawk. Okay, and that requires frequent testing and chest, and chest CT scan. So that's something that you need to keep in mind and we'll, we'll go over all of these in detail. And then the fourth aspect is that because, especially in IBM, but also in some severe forms of myositis, you're not moving as much, you're not putting as much stress on your body, and therefore some of these respiratory-related symptoms, especially shortness of breath, gets ignored or does, does not manifest. But one of the things that our group found a few years ago, and this, this was seen even earlier by the British group, is that if you measure pulmonary functions in IBM, they are lower than normal individuals that age. That means that there is an involvement of the diaphragm muscle, and that may contribute to some of the complications of the disease as the disease gets advanced. So as I said, the, the two sources of complication in IBM, other than the weakness and the, and the risk of fall, is swallowing abnormalities may result in pneumonia because you're now the, the food is going down or the liquids are going down the wrong passage, but also because your lungs are not expanding fully, they're more susceptible to pneumonia and, and respiratory complications are not uncommon in IBM as well, okay? Heart is something that usually does not affect the IBM patients, so I'm not gonna mention that. So <clears throat> what are the diseases that would, so, Pulmonary complications are very common in dermatomyositis. And at least in this meeting, you will hear this syndrome called antisynthetase syndrome. Okay? And people used to lump antisynthetase syndrome as part of polymyositis or as part of dermatomyositis. But it turns out that antisynthetase syndrome is a separate entity. So it's now become the fourth different form of myositis that we think about. So the traditional forms of inflammatory muscle disease or myositis were polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and inclusion body myositis. But now antisynthetase syndrome becomes the fourth member of that family. 
And then necrotizing immune myopathy, or NAM, is the fifth member of that family. So there are five distinct groups of myositis. Okay? As I said, polymyositis is probably the most controversial. Okay? And again, for somebody as dogmatic as I am, probably doesn't exist. Dermato is the commonest form. Okay? And dermato you can see across all age groups. So you see children, you see adults, you see older individuals. Dermato also has the highest association with cancer. So one of the things that I routinely recommend is that anyone who's recently been diagnosed with dermatomyositis should probably undergo screening for cancer, whatever the insurance company provides for. If you can get a PET scan, that's the best. If you can't get a PET scan, at least get CT scans of the chest and abdomen and make sure somebody does an examination for bre of the breast, an examination of the ovaries and stuff like that. And then, um, the other complication with dermato is the lung involvement. And that's true for dermato, and that's true for antisynthetase syndrome. So patients with dermatomyositis and, uh, and antisynthetase syndrome get a, um, an involvement of the lung by something called interstitial lung disease, where the muscles are okay, so the diaphragm is not affected. The external intercostal, which is the muscles between your rib, is unaffected, but it's the path or the substance of the lung that gets affected. And it manifests by lack of oxygen absorption in the lung, okay? So the way you test for it is you do a pulmonary function test and you specifically look for what's called diffusion capacity of oxygen so they, they can actually measure how much oxygen is diffusing through the lung capacity. Okay, and that's a very specific test that we, we order every time we are looking for interstitial lung disease. And the other way to look for it is to do a CT scan of the chest. And what you're looking for is abnormality of whiteness in the lung that may suggest that there is progressive scarring, a progressive fibrosis of the lung. Okay? It's something that you want to catch early. Okay? So that's why you have to be aggressive and proactive about it. Um, and in, in some cases, it is potentially treatable. Okay? And that's why all the more reason why your rheumatologist or your internist or your neurologist has to be super aggressive about it. Now, there are antibodies. So I'm, I don't know how many of you as part of your myositis have had antibodies tested. The neurologists tend to have a harder time with testing antibodies. Somehow they tend to be more non-believers than rheumatologists. Uh, it still annoys me, I'm a neurologist. Uh, so I, again, a lot of my time is spent trying to convince neurologists that antibodies have a distinct value, an added value in diagnosis and management of, of uh, myositis. And one of the greatest value is being able to predict if somebody is at risk for cancer, and if somebody is at risk for lung disease. Okay? So one of the reasons it may not impact your treatment, okay? and it may not necessarily help the diagnosis because dermato is otherwise quite distinct because they have skin rash, one of the ways that the antibodies really help in dermato is being able to predict. Okay? So there are five different types of dermato uh, antibodies. You don't have to know all of them. But the one that has the highest association with cancer is an antibody called TIF1 gamma, T-I-F, number one, and the alphabet gamma from the Greek literature on that. It's called TIF1 gamma, T-I-F, number one, gamma. And if, you, if somebody who has dermato or dermato-like picture and has a TIF1 gamma, there's a very, very high risk of malignancy in that patient, okay? And that's the kind of patient that I would probably screen every three months or every six months for cancer up to two years. Now, if they've gone two years and more, they're probably safe, but the first two years is where the highest risk is, okay? And then there are two antibodies that will predict the risk of um, interstitial lung disease, okay? So there is the MDA5, which is much more common in the Asian population than the Caucasian population. So most of the reports come from Japan and Asia, but it does exist in the US, okay? 
the, the peculiar thing about um, MDA5 is that they don't get much muscle weakness. They only have dermato skin changes, but they usually don't have much muscle weakness, but it has about a 90% association with lung disease. Okay, so again, if somebody has MDA5 dermatomyositis, they are at an incredibly high risk for um, lung disease. And then the other antibody is NXP2, which is again a rare antibody, N, capital N, capital X, capital P2, and that it has association with calcinosis, which is the calcium deposits under the skin, but also malignancy and lung, and lung disease, okay? And then JO1, which is the primary antibody in antisynthetase syndrome, and I'm sure at least some of you have been tested for JO1 because that's been around since the 1980s. JO1 has about a 65% risk of interstitial lung disease. Right. So again, I would, I would encourage you is when after you get done with this meeting, go back to your physicians and make sure that especially if you have a diagnosis of polymyositis or dermatomyositis or necrotizing myopathy, your physicians should be testing these antibodies. These are commercially available, paid for by the insurance company. They may give you some grief because insurance companies by default want to save money, so they question everything we do, but you, you should have it done. Okay, because that will help you predict that. Because once the interstitial lung disease sets in, it's a little bit more challenging to treat it. Okay, and that's why it's important to, to keep looking for the subtle abnormalities, the early abnormalities. And some of, these treat, some of these may be responsive to rotoxan treatment or aggressive chemotherapy treatment. And that's why it's important to know what you have on that. Now, the... So that's one aspect where you have the interstitial lung disease where the lung parenchyma is abnormal. The other situation is when you have problems with muscle weakness, especially the diaphragm muscles are weak, okay? So if your diaphragm muscles are starting to get weak, the main manifestation that you will have, the earliest manifestation you will have is getting short of breath with exertion. So when you walk, when you talk, when you try to go upstairs, you will get short-winded, okay? And that, in our term, is called dyspnea on exertion or shortness of breath on exertion, okay? Now, if you have limited mobility, that you may not manifest that because you're not moving around as much. The other way it manifests is when you lay down, the human body was, by design, not meant to lay down it was meant to be staying up erect as much as possible. When you lay down, your rib cage doesn't move as much, and your stomach contents push the diaphragm up into the lungs. So if anyone has diaphragmatic problem or diaphragm weakness, they will manifest it more when they're laying flat, okay? And they feel short of breath. So the first, first compensation they do is they start turning onto their side, because they get more comfortable turning onto their side. The next stage would be they start propping themselves up by using more and more pillows, okay? So one of the questions that we ask is, how many pillows do you use when you sleep, okay? So if you were a one pillow person and now you have to prop yourself up into on two pillows or three pillows, that means that you are starting to get what's called orthopnea or shortness of breath when you're laying flat, okay? And, and then there are patients who prefer to sleep in a recliner because they know that they get short of breath when they're lying down flat, okay? So that, that's the other manifestation. Yes, ma'am? What about oxygen or oxygen given? Right? Is that also because of the diaphragm weakness? So you don't try to treat diaphragm weakness with oxygen, okay? You try to treat the lung issue with oxygen, not the diaphragm weakness. Okay. Diaphragm problem is a mechanical problem and it should be treated with a BiPAP rather than an oxygen. Okay, yes? Well, that, I was gonna talk about that next, okay? So the third manifestation of having diaphragm weakness is something called sleep disordered breathing, which means that when you're sleeping, your oxygen level dips down, okay? And they result in microscopic arousal. So you're not, it's not big enough to wake you up from sleep, but it affects the quality of your sleep, okay? So you wake up less fresh, 
Okay? So it's what in the sleep terminology is called non-restorative sleep. That means that you're not getting the rest that you're supposed to get from the sleep. Or you wake up in the morning with a headache. Okay? Or sometimes you would feel that food doesn't taste as well because your carbon dioxide levels in your blood have gone up and that affects the taste. Okay? So sleep disordered breathing is very common, especially with diaphragmatic weakness. Can be, sim can be very easily studied by doing a sleep study. Okay? Uh, and that's, that's why it's important. Okay? And these are correctable issues. You, if somebody has, is developing diaphragmatic weakness, or if somebody is developing sleep disordered breathing, you can fix it by using a positive pressure ventilation. So these are the CPAPs and the BiPAPs that you may have heard about. A lot of people with sleep apnea use CPAP. And the purpose there is to give continuous pressure, positive pressure, so your airways stay open longer, you absorb more oxygen, you blow out more carbon dioxide, and you overcome that problem that you have from weakness of the diaphragm. Okay? The diaphragm problem is a mechanical problem. If you give this person oxygen through a nasal cannula, this person will become too comfortable, stop breathing on you. Because they no longer have to breathe, because they, you're getting the oxygen, the body is sensing the oxygen levels are normalizing, therefore why should I breathe? And it's, it can potentially be dangerous in somebody who has advanced um, diaphragmatic weakness. Okay? So that, that there the solution is giving them a BiPAP or a CPAP, not oxygen. Whereas if you have interstitial lung disease and you're not absorbing enough oxygen, but your muscles are okay, then oxygen is a better treatment for it than giving a BiPAP. Okay, I saw some hands for questions. Am I overreacting? Okay. All right, um, <clears throat> and then, then the extreme, so if these are the first three symptoms and then you get shortness of breath um, and shortness of breath at rest, okay? And if you get shortness of breath at rest, that means your lung capacity has already dropped down to 50% or lower, okay? Now these are very commonly measured in a neuromuscular clinic, so in our clinic, any patient that comes through gets pulmonary function testing done, lung function testing done, so we look for the lung capacity, which you have them blow out as, as hard as they can get, okay? So the, you take a deep breath, you put a mouthpiece in your, in your mouth, which is attached to a machine, and you breathe out as, or exhale out as hard as you can in one minute's time. The other test that we do is direct measure of the diaphragmatic strength, which is called inspiratory pressure. Okay, so it's, it's called MIP or it's called NIF in, in terminology. And that's when you take a really deep breath and see how negative you can go in terms of uh, pressure. Okay, it's like regular sniff that we do. That is the same thing. Okay, we are taking a deep breath and that has to do with your diaphragm. People who have diaphragmatic weakness will have reduced sniff. Okay, and then cough is the other feature. People who have weakness of the muscles cannot cough as much. They have difficulty coughing out secretions, they have difficulties clearing out their lungs, and then you can imagine why they would have problems with pneumonia or, or trapped uh, mucus in there. Okay. But these are measurable, these are preventable, these are fixable. Okay. And that's why you need to be aggressive and proactive about it. Yes, ma'am? Is bronchiectasis also common? Because I have both IOB and bronchiectasis. Well, I, I think bronchiectasis is just a complication of the ILD. It's, again, when you have repeated damage to the lung, your, your airways become larger, and that's when they call it bronchiectasis. So it's a, it's a result of the ILD, um, not necessarily a feature separate from it. So do you have a question in the back? Do you have a question in the back? OK. Yes, ma'am. I, are you meaning test or exercise uh, of yeah, treatment? Exercise. So again, um, because your oxygen levels are low, people don't like to exercise because they get short-winded more easily. Um, again, ex exercise is never bad. Let let me put it out there. Okay, the if the bad effects of exercise are still much better than the bad effects of not exercising.
not for the interstitial lung disease. For the diaphragmatic weakness, if you do things like incentive spirometry, you can improve that lung function, but interstitial lung disease, I'm not familiar with any specific forms of exercise that may improve it. Yeah? Uh, you answered it. Oh, okay, good. Yes, sir. I was under the impression that I have prevented my sight and interstitial lung disease, yeah. but it's mild. Yes. So my doctor told me that two things can happen. Two things can Yeah. Was, there we go. Um, I, my doctor said that there's two things he's looking for in interstitial lung disease. One is the scarring, which he said was permanent and not treatable. True. Okay. And the other is inflammation that could, I guess, lead to scarring. True. That he can handle. Okay, so I, I misunderstood you earlier when you said if you have interstitial lung disease, we can... And, and that's why it's important to pick it up early. Yeah. You want to pick it up before the scarring happens. Okay? So when you have early changes on the lung function test that suggest your oxygen diffusion capacity is going down, or if the MRI or a CT scan of the chest shows changes that are suggestive of interstitial lung disease, you want to treat it at that time. Right. Once the scarring happens and your lung has already contracted, it's very difficult to bring it back. Okay. And again, some of these are related to like things like JO1, myositis, or other things, which there is a lot more robust data out there, literature out there that suggests that treatment with rotoxan or high doses of cyclophosphamide may reduce or prevent the scarring of the tissue. With regular dermatomyositis, I'm not sure how strong the data is yet. But it's again, the point is, we need to be on top of it. We need to right. be aggressive about it. Yeah, right now it's uh, cell set and predators. Yes. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good combination. Yes, sir. So it depends on the disease you have. If you have dermatomyositis or polymyositis. IBM usually doesn't have lung involvement other than diaphragm involvement. So you don't need to test for interstitial lung disease. You may, st I would still recommend that at least you be tested once a year for diaphrag diaphragmatic weakness. But IBM does not have the interstitial lung disease. Yeah, so the challenge is that if you, and especially in women, it becomes difficult because they may lack some of the features of IBM right at the beginning. The literature suggests, and, and Dr. Marianne Divisor, who's also here, um, and she's published a lot on this as well. If you follow patients who, especially after the age of 45, if you follow patients who've been diagnosed with PM, five years later, you will see that most of them have IBM, or they may have necrotizing myopathy with either SRP or HMGCR antibodies. Okay, because um, I have a diagnosis of PM, but with the DM, I, I don't have any muscle weakness right now. I don't have a rash. Um, so I guess we lean more towards the IBM. Why, again, I'm... And I'm over 50. But why were you diagnosed with PM if you don't have muscle weakness? Well, because of all the blood tests we, we treat patients, we don't, we, don't, we don't treat labs, we treat patients. And I had a biopsy. Okay, well, we, we can talk offline because I'm, okay. because I, I, so, so, so the question really is that for, mus, for diagnosis of polymyositis, the traditional way is muscle weakness and a high CK, right? So 
Dermatomyositis, you can have no muscle weakness, that's fine, but I'm talking about polymyositis specifically. So dermatomyositis, a good number may only have skin changes and no muscle weakness or minimal muscle weakness. About 6% may have muscle weakness without any skin changes, okay? That's, that's well known. You can even have normal CK and still have dermatomyositis. PM, on the other hand, you have to have elevated muscle enzymes and you have to have muscle weakness, okay? Just because you had high CK, there are 10 different other diseases that can cause high CK. There are 10 different other diseases that can cause muscle inflammation. And that's the problem. So we've had cases where patients eventually turned out to have a genetic disease called Pompe disease, and they were treated as polymyositis. There are forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy that, that can look like polymyositis. So that's why I am always challenged the diagnosis of polymyositis. If you really carefully study, only about 3% of patients will remain with a diagnosis of polymyositis, whatever that may be. Yes. And heart, my heart's was to take this one of the first sons I had of their metamyositis. Yes. How does that relate to interstitial lung disease or is, is it separate? No, so it, it's a complication of interstitial lung disease. Pulmonary hypertension is a problem that happens with long standing lung disease. I okay. Have, I have negative J, is it J01? Yes, J01, yeah. I have negative. But, but there are other antibodies as well. So there's a plethora of antibodies. So there are eight different antibodies for antisynthetase syndrome. There are five different antibodies for dermato. There are a couple of other antibodies. So I just, again, somebody needs to take a more detailed look on that, okay? Sleep apnea or undiagnosed, untreated sleep apnea can also result in pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so that's something that you want to also make sure. People with neuromuscular weakness tend to have a higher risk of sleep apnea. And that's why it's important that if there is a suspicion for sleep apnea, you should undergo a sleep study, make sure that you, because these are treatable conditions. You can, you can reverse the, I'm saying what? Yes, and people who have diaphragmatic weakness are at higher risk for sleep apnea. Okay, that's why the lower threshold for doing a sleep study and if you need to be on BiPAP or CPAP, you need to be on BiPAP or CPAP. And that. Ask it, ask it. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? My son was diagnosed. Okay, so my son was diagnosed last summer. Yes. Um, he was intubated for 15 days. Yes. With lung disease. Yes. Um, they determined that he had a form of idiopathic and with overlap syndrome. Did he have muscle weakness as well? He, he did not present that and they did not do a biopsy because he was on prednisone. So they said that it, his inflammation probably went down, so there was really no point doing a muscle biopsy. Yes. But he did have scarring lungs, and he was going to treat heart lung disease on the cell side. My question is, is he never tested for any antibodies? So, um, and I was about he to... Tested so I was about to bring up that issue. Okay. Um, so again, interstitial lung disease can happen on its own, okay? It's not always associated with myositis, okay? <coughs> and there are patients with myositis, or at least who will eventually turn out to have myositis, may sometimes present with interstitial lung disease as their first manifestation. But these patients go to lung specialists, and lung specialists usually don't think about muscle diseases, okay? But there is this recognition that people who are presenting primarily or purely with lung weakness or lung disease may have underlying muscle disease or overlap, whatever you want to call it. And then the treatment may be different in it, okay? So now there are treatments available for interstitial lung disease. There are two new drugs that got approved. But again, so really the difference is, and distinction which is very important is, is this idiopathic or primary lung uh, interstitial lung disease? Because then you go that route and you go treat them with those two medications or if it's bad enough, then you're on a lung transplant list. Or if it's related to a myositis or a connective tissue disease, a rheumatological disease, because then you can try, think about rotoxan, or you can think about cyclophosphamide or Celsept, 
and things like that. Okay, and that's why it's important. The, the challenge, and again, this is my jaded, uh, cantankerous view on life, that our lung uh, training programs in pulmonary medicine, they are so enamored with lung cancers and they're so enamored with asthma uh, and COPD that they don't teach them about muscle diseases anymore. They don't teach them about muscle diseases that can affect the lungs. So even when the pulmonologists order lung function testing, they often omit the most important testing as far as muscle is concerned. Okay? I, we've become our local resource for our pulmonologists and they actually would rather have us deal with those pulmonary issues because they're so busy treating cancers and doing invasive procedures, they don't want to deal with um, muscle issues anymore. Okay? But that's the, that's the problem with the system is those things tend to make more money for them, but, which is my, again, very cynical, jaded view on life. Um, because it's, because the, the healthcare cost has gone up, our education cost has gone up, people are gravitating to things that generate more revenue. Okay? And things are getting ignored in that sense. We need to fix the problem, and I think somebody will at least hopefully fix it at some point. Okay. Um, so that, yeah. I'm about to go there. Okay. The other question is, apparently there's the two types of DM, amyopathic and just plain DM, so to speak. So amyopathic and literature has been more prevalent for cancer, but if you have the TIF, F, which I have, it doesn't make a difference which one you have, you still can have prevalence for cancer. Yeah, so, T, so again, so they, what, um, so amyopathic essentially means that your muscles are not involved. Okay, so they are, the muscles are not weak. So amyopathic dermatomyositis essentially means that you have the skin rash, but your muscle weakness is either very mild or none, right? And that happens in about 20% of cases. In the Asian population, MDA5 is the antibody that will most commonly do that, okay? But there are other forms of dermato that may not have any muscle weakness, not necessary. Whereas TIF1 gamma, which is what you say you have, um, is more associated with cancer, but usually presents with more typical dermatomyositis where you have skin and muscle changes. So that's what they have. Yeah, okay. But I think you've had dermato for a while, so in your case, TIF1 gamma may not um, be as predictive of a cancer because you've already gone the first two years out and you're done. You're done fine. The other part of the question on the myositis website recently I saw an article about the TIFF plus some additional factors that uh, initiate the cancer. Yes. Are you familiar with that article? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I reviewed that article, so I'm, I'm familiar with it. But I, I, a lot of this is in a state of evolution. So we don't know if that applies to everyone. Most of those literature that you're citing came from Japan, um, and whether it applies to Caucasian population, the non-Japanese population, we're not sure yet. So for instance, if you look at the Japanese population, their IBM cases, um, about one-fourth to one-third of them are associated with hepatitis C. Well, this article is also specific to DM. Yeah, no, I'm just saying that, I mean, I think the point I'm trying to make is there is something unique and different about the Japanese population that you cannot generalize that to the general Caucasian population on that, uh, on that. So, as was pointed out, I haven't talked about the heart much. Um, and frankly, heart is not an issue in IBM. So any, any of you who have IBM can, can uh, sort of breathe a, a sigh of relief because that's not usually the case. Okay, and again, if heart is getting involved, it's probably age-related more than the disease-related issue. Okay, yeah. So it's again, people with IBM are usually above the age of 50. Your your history of cholesterol, your history of smoking, your your family history of heart disease, all of that act in. But again, common things being far more common. So that's probably related. Yeah. 
sometimes that happens. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Are you t referring in specifically to IBM or all of my side? Well, I have IBM, but I'm just curious. So in IBM, as I said, the, uh, again, first of all, there's still a debate about whether the inflammation is the primary problem or a secondary problem. As far as we can tell, there is no muscle involvement, uh, either inflammatory or otherwise, in IBM. Okay? There, as I suggested, there is a diaphragm involvement, but the heart is usually not affected. Whereas in dermatomyositis, in necrotizing myopathies, in, in, um, in antisynthetase syndrome, the heart may get involved because that in same inflammation that is happening in the muscle may also affect the cardiac muscle, may also affect the pulmonary muscles. One of the categories of myositis that we are starting to see more and more are myositis that occurs because of certain chemotherapies. So there's a new class of chemotherapy called PD-1 inhibitors or checkpoint inhibitors. So for melanoma, which is a very aggressive skin cancer, for the non-small cell lung cancers that usually had a death warrant attached to it, so as was metastatic melanoma, there is now a very effective chemotherapy. There's a class of drug called PD-1 uh, inhibitors. Uh, so Pembrolizumab or okay, Ketruda, you may have seen ads for it. But they, in about 1% of patients who take this drug, may develop myositis as well as myocarditis, which means that the heart is also inflamed. It responds when you take them off the treatment. It responds to steroids and IVIG, but it can create a lot of problems during the chemotherapy. And sometimes you have to stop the chemotherapy because of that. So we are starting to see more and more of these cases. We recently had a gentleman who had metastatic melanoma um, was responding beautifully to the cancer treatment, but then ended up with a very severe necrotizing myopathy from the chemotherapy itself. Okay. So there's a whole class of drugs, and I don't, I may not know, but in generally they're called checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and they they can create havoc with all sorts of autoimmune diseases. It's not only muscle disease; they can cause myasthenia gravis, they can cause problems with the pituitary gland. Um, colitis, the inflammation of the colon, is very common in that. That's about 3% of incidence of colon inflammation there. And that. They are wonderful. I mean, they are life-saving drugs, but they create all sorts of havoc. Because the mechanism is that they are essentially, um, what they are allowing is the immune system to get hyped up and attack the cancer. So the cancer gets control, but then you have the innocent bystanders, which are the rest of the body, that gets attacked by the same immune cells. That. So the heart may get involved. Now the, the subtle symptoms of heart involvement are palpitation, which is increased heart rate. Okay? And that may happen in individuals' muscle disease anyway because they don't exercise as much. So you have, ex you have reduced exercise tolerance, so your heart rate tends to run higher. But if your heart rate is constantly running in the hundreds and hundred and tens, then you suspect that something is going on. Shortness of breath. Okay, so if somebody is getting short of breath with exertion or with minimal exertion, that may be a heart of, of heart involvement, sign of heart involvement. Chest pain is common in these patients. Chest pain sometimes can be very subtle. So if you have left shoulder pain, or if you have this constant feeling of, of feeling gassy in your stomach, that may be a manifestation of heart disease as well. So don't ignore that. Okay? Um, and then um, they can present with features of heart failure, which means that their legs are swelling up, um, their stomach is swelling up because they, they can't pump fluid anymore. Okay? Heart involvement is common in some of the myositis. Okay? It's a complication of the disease, and it usually generally responds to the treatment that you're giving for the myositis. Uh, you, you can manage heart failure. You can manage some of the rhythm issues, so you may need to get extra medication for the rhythm abnormalities. Sometimes they have to put in a pacemaker for the rhythm abnormalities. Sometimes you have to put salt restriction so you don't absorb as much water. So you, you restrict the fluid, they restrict the amount of salt. Okay? And uh, sometimes you have to give diuretics to just pee out the extra amount of fluids that you get. But generally, it would respond 
to the treatment that is being given for the dermato or the poly or the antisynthetase. And that, okay? It's a rare complication. I have, to, I have to say that we take care of a large number of myositis patients, and I may have seen it maybe in less than 5% of my cases. Okay, so unlike the pulmonary involvement, which is much more prevalent, cardiac involvements tend to be much less frequent than the pulmonary involvement. <coughs> yes? How about the follow up care from heart disease, heart attack, where the cardiologist wants you to take statins? Does that help? That is a great that's question. So that's, a, that's an excellent question. And this, question. So the question that we get asked today and get asked often is that if you have a muscle disease and your cardiologist wants to put you on a cholesterol-lowering medication, what do you do? Okay? And, and this, this comes from the fact that we know that about 1% of patients who take statin class of drug, which is one of the popular cholesterol-lowering medications, can get a very severe muscle disease called necrotizing myopathy. Okay? So it's, about, it's only what, about 1% of people Okay, so it's a very small. My stance on statin is very simple. Statin has really changed the game as far as medicine is concerned. They are life-saving drugs. Okay? If you want stroke prevention, if you want heart disease prevention, statin is the way to go. Okay? So they are wonder drugs as far as I'm concerned. And I don't want to be a fear monger. I don't want to be, uh, make statins the boogeyman. Okay? The st risk of statins, or serious muscle complication from statin, is less than 1%. Okay, that means that 99% of the population can safely take statins without any problem. Now, the patients who already have muscle disease pose a special problem because one of the ways we monitor if somebody is getting complications from statin is to check their CK. And if the CK is already high, and if they already have muscle weakness, what do you do with that? Okay. So what we normally do is in that situation would be we would do a careful exam and document what the muscle weakness level is, okay, because that will serve as your baseline guide, okay, and if you have a drastic increase in weakness on the next visit, which we don't expect from inclusion body myositis or some of the other myositis, then you know it's related to the statins. You check their baseline CK. So again, as you know, most patients with IBM will not have a CK more than 500, right? If the, if the patient now has gone to 3,000 of a CK, that's a problem because that's something else. And the third thing that we check for is the HMG-CR antibodies, okay? So HMG-CR antibodies were described by Dr. Mammon, who's in this meeting, and I'm sure you'll hear him multiple times this meeting. Um, HMG-CR antibodies were specifically associated with necrotizing myopathy, so that's the one, less than 1% 1 of patients who have um, this antibody. The problem is, if you have HMG-CR antibodies, then you are probably should not be taking statins because you will get problems with it. Okay? But again, that's less than 1% of the population. It is called HMGCR. HMG CR, yeah. So, if, so again, the, the only time that I would not allow somebody to take statins is if, if they were known to have HMGCR antibodies. Other than that, it's all depending on case-to-case -case situation. If you can, if you're comfortable with their level of weakness being steady, if you know their CK is steady, there's absolutely no harm in taking cholesterol medication. But the only exception to that rule would be, would be if they have pre-existing HMGCR antibody. That's an absolute no-no. Just to clarify, you would test for that antibody before you go test? So if a cardiologist sends me a patient saying, can I put this patient on statin, I would say, hold off, let's test the HMGCR. The results come back in 10 days, and I would hold off on the treatment till that happens. Now, cardiologists don't always listen to me. Cardiologists don't always check a CK beforehand as well, which really annoys me. Um, but that, those are some of the common sense things that you would do. Because that's exactly where I'm at now. We're almost to the point of tapering off the steroids. I'm down to the five milligrams. So we're holding steady on the CK for a few months. So I asked my uh, rheumatologist, I says, you guys seem to have ruled out statins, so I have a high cholesterol. Very bad family history. So 
How about reintroducing statins? And she would no, no, no. Again, so if you already, I mean, they may have already tested you for HMGCR. I don't think so. Okay, now if not, that that's a simple test that they can do. It's um, and you should be have the results back in about ten days. Yeah. So again, I'm not as current on the cardiology literature. There are newer drugs of cholesterol drugs that don't don't affect the statin pathway. So I, I would, I would, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with you going on statins. I would just make sure that you don't have the HMGCR antibodies. Yes, sir. Uh, so for those of the DM, do you recommend anything beyond the heart? Any anything beyond the standard you know, work about a physical, including lipid panel? Yes, yeah, so I would do at least a one-time EKG. And so if so, the patients who get diagnosed first with dermatomyositis. I would do an EKG. I would make sure that I, um, if they, uh, at least do an echocardiogram the first time. If they don't have, if they have a normal study, normal EKG, normal echocardiogram, they have absolutely no symptoms. Every visit that they come in, I won't do anything different at that point. Well, I've had, I had the EKG several times, but not an echocardiogram. Yeah, but again, EKG is good enough. So, I mean, if the EKG doesn't show any abnormality, you can use that. I tend to be a little bit more compulsive about it, so I do an echogram at least once. So you don't recommend a cardiac MRI? No. I, again, the problem with cardiac MRI is it's too sensitive. So there are, there are times where you see abnormalities without any clinical correlates, and we still don't know what to do with it. Cardiologists love it. I'm not sure that the jury is completely decided on whether it's good or not. So it, 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 it's, I mean, cardiac MRIs are way too sensitive. So right, catheter, right heart catheterization is only reserved for people with pulmonary hypertension. It's not a routine procedure. It's a, it's a, risk, it's a procedure with significant risk. So it's done in very special situations only when you suspect a right heart failure or pulmonary hypertension. I'm sorry, you had a question, Mr. Anderson? Just to resolve the situation between my cardiologist and my family doctor. I should ask to make sure I've got a, a reading on my CK and uh, then the HMGCR. Yes. So again, if your cardiologist or if your family practitioner wants to put you on statin medication, make sure you check a CK, which would be serve as your baseline. Have your neurologist or have your internist do a baseline neurological exam and test for the HMGCR. And if your HMGCR is positive, then I would think twice about starting you on statins. Yes, what is the prognosis of someone with uh, DM who has the anti-JO1 uh, who is diagnosed with interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension? So the prognosis is not as good as patients who have DM without any of those complications. And that's, that's the big problem with JO1. JO1 is about, has a 65% risk of developing interstitial lung disease. And when you develop interstitial lung disease, then the long-term complication is scarring and pulmonary hypertension. Do they always do the heart catheterization if, you have, if you've been diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension? So again, the traditional way of diagnosing right heart failure or pulmonary hypertension is to do a right heart catheterization. Okay. Now, the MRIs are getting superior, the echoes are getting superior. So again, as I said, I have not kept up with the cardiology literature, and maybe they're doing it without doing all of those things. But that was a traditional way of diagnosing it. Okay. And again, as far as your treatment is concerned, uh, again, there is literature with antibody-related myositis that rutoxan or rutoximab may not only treat the muscle weakness, reduce your titers of the antibody, but may also have an improvement in the lung disease. So if you've never been treated with rotoxan, I would at least discuss it with a rheumatologist and see if that's a possibility. And when you say um, that that will treat the lung disease, the scarring is... Scarring is permanent. permanent. Yeah. 
Yeah. But it can stop or slow the progression. So if there is active inflammation in the lung, which is the interstitial pneumonitis, then rutoxan should control that. If there is a lot of scarring, the scarring may not come back. Thank you. Yes. My situation is, um, when I first got heavy symptoms for demand myositis, um, I thought it was related to my satin use. So I went off the statins voluntarily on my own. So when I was going through the testing for myositis, um, they didn't think it was statin related because I had been off of it and my CKs were all normal. Okay? Um, but after discussing it with my doctor, John Hopkins, we decided to do the HMGCR testing. I was normal for that, um, but I had also done poorly on the stress test, had a heart cath test, and that came back normal. Um, so they decided to put me back on statins. I was on statins less than a month, and then I was physically immobile and could not move. So I went off to the statins again, and I was fine within two days. <laughs> um, so any recommendation, where do I go? So, so Again, um, and do you know how high did your CK go when you were in that capac incapacitated state? No, because um, my doctor was out of town, and by the time she got back in town, I had already took myself off of it. Yeah. But she did test my CKs, and she saw that they were still elevated. But how much elevated? Above 1,000, below 1,000? No, it didn't break the norm, but I had been off of it yeah. two days before I saw So the, the challenge with statin is, the, a, a number of individuals will get muscle pain and muscle cramps, okay? So there are patients who are intolerant of statins in that sense that they get, it's a nuisance value. They get, they feel, they don't feel good, their muscles are achy, their muscles are hurting, but they don't necessarily get weakness, okay? Um, and that is, happens in about five to six percent of people who take statins, okay? To me, and again, I'm not on the receiving end, and I've been on statins for now almost seven years, and luckily I've not had any problems. But that's not a good enough reason to go off statins. Now, you, what you're describing is little more than that, okay? Yeah, so I, so, yeah, so I, but I, what I'm saying is that, that the, the, the complaints of muscle pain and achiness or muscle cramping mm -hmm. is reasonably common, and, and, but it's not catastrophic, and it's, when you, when you weigh the risks and the benefits of the statin, the, the benefits outweigh the risks at that point. Now, that the catastrophic weakness where you get severe weakness with CKs, usually in the 10,000 range, that only happens in less than 1%, and those are patients with HMGCR antibodies, okay? That doesn't happen in majority of the patients with the statin. So well, I, I, my question is, do antibodies develop over time, or are they, are they always they, they can, ch well, I mean, they, they, it can develop later on, so you may want to get tested again for it, but I would say that if you are test negative again, mm -hmm. then I would either try a different version of a statin or maybe try and then go on a newer version of the, of the cholesterol-lowering medication because it sounds like you have significant heart disease that needs to be treated. Well, I just have a question. Just wait for the mic, sir. When you talk about high and you say 500, 9,500, you know, that's not high. Is there, could there be anything wrong or is there anything else to look at even though you've got this? If your CK was 23,000? So, so let's address this issue, okay? So people who are bodybuilders, have high muscle mass, will have high CK, okay? Well, I'm talking about oh, I'm just saying. So again, what I'm saying is that you, there is, when labs will say a level above 200 is abnormal, okay? That is not necessarily true. So people who exercise on a regular basis, people who have larger muscle mass, can run CKs up to 400, 500. We know African-American individuals tend to run higher CKs, so in them, up to 800 would be considered normal. Okay, there are families that tend to have high CKs. Usually it's carried in a sex-linked fashion. That means it comes from the mother side of the family. They can run CKs of up to 800, okay? <coughs> but generally, if your CK is above 500, that's considered abnormal. In 
in traditional myositis, like polymyositis or dermatomyositis, you almost never see CKs above 2,000. If uh, in IBM, it would be very unusual to see CK up to 1,000. I would actually question the diagnosis if somebody has a CK of 1,000 or more. I would question the diagnosis of dermato if the quest CK is more than 3,000, okay? Yeah, so 23,000 is something that normally we see with necrotizing myopathy, which is associated with either HMGCR or SRP antibodies. Okay, that's unusual for poly or dermato or even antisynthetase syndrome. Although antisynthetase syndromes, occasionally you may see that high, but not 23,000. So we should really be testing for the HMGCR. HMGCR. Yeah. Um, in the, right in the back. I feel like I'm directing traffic now. Uh, I'm glad to hear that there was a number of 23,000 for the CK, because mine was 27,000, and they thought I came from out of space somewhere. And, um, what, but was it a one time or multiple? Uh, uh, multiple times. And what's normal for me now is 1,600, 1,200, and every now and then we go down to 600. And this is coming from a person who used to run 55 miles a week. See, that's the problem. You, you ran too much. <laughs> no, so I, 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 again, I would, you, you, you for sure should be tested for HMGCR because that is an incredibly high CK. Because I've had polymyositis for 14 years. It doesn't exist, remember? You didn't listen to me. <laughs> All right, other questions? Oh, okay. Is it possible to have IBM and the necrotizing? Because my symptoms began when I started taking the statins. Do you really want to give yourself two diseases? No, I don't. Okay. I don't at all. But then, my, uh, I guess my, my total CK has not gone below 1,200. Actually, 1,200 plus is the lowest it's been. I did have the muscle biopsy, um, for, and it did show IBM. And, and your treating physician is a rheumatologist? or a rheumatologist. Okay, and so have they looked at the biopsy? They did take okay. the biopsy. I can tell you that it's very important to look at the biopsy. And again, I haven't clinically examined you. IBM is usually difficult to miss. Okay? So if, if the rheumatologist and neurologist is experienced at looking at IBM, that's a disease that you normally don't miss. But I have, had, I have taken care of patients where they were told they had necrotizing myopathy on muscle pathology, and the muscle pathology was classical for IBM. Okay, so I would have your rheumatologist at least look at the and see what was the basis for calling it IBM, especially if the clinical features are not there. But the clinical features is you, you have to have finger flexor weakness and you have to have quadriceps weakness. Or, and if you have that, that's probably IBM unless proven otherwise. Even for the higher that's fine. I mean, again, I said there, there are exceptions to every rule. No, no, I, I, was, I was just making about 50 miles a week is a little too much, yeah. <laughs> for, from, a, from a couch potato, that would be a lot, yeah. How many of the IBM patients should have pulmonary function testing, including tests of diaphragm function? Once a year. And then the diaphragm function testing is a sniff test? Well, it's not a sniff test because most That's U.S. labs cannot do sniff lab. So it's called MIP, or maximum inspiratory pressure. Okay. Yeah, sniff is sniff. You can do it on x-ray, but uh, in, at least on the North American side, SNP is still very much a research tool. It's not a clinical term. So it's just MIP? MIP. Yes. If you're loud enough, I can hear you, and I can repeat. Uh, um, 15 years ago, I met a lady with Guillermo and Tachyponium, and back then, my whole entire was Let's do it. Let's do it again. How high is the tachycardia? I don't know. They put me on Metropolo. Yeah. So how? But isn't that? So I would I would just make sure that you get tested for myocarditis, which is the inflammation of the muscle. Myocarditis. 
Yeah. How do you find a cardiologist who knows about no, I mean, sinus? No, but mo most cardiologists can pick up abnormalities on the heart. So I, you don't need a specialized cardiologist for them. Yeah. yeah, again, what you need to look for is what's happening on your EKG and what's happening on your ultrasound of the heart. And if there are any evidence for what's called myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. Okay, thank you. I have DM and coronary basal spasm. Um, it was diagnosed after catheterization and a heart MRI and it's being, um, being treated with um, long-acting nitrates, and it seems to be managing it fairly well, but I just wonder if there's anything else I need to be cautious of or looking for. No, it, it, it's not a common association with dermatomyositis, so it may be true and true unrelated, okay? Um, but there are individuals who get coronary artery vasospasms, and the treatment would be nitrates mm -hmm. on that. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily, just because you have DM as well, that that's necessarily, it's not a common occurrence in DM. Hi, Dr. Ali. Um, I'm a patient with uh, coronary artery vasospasm. Uh, I'm just wondering, you have this uh, follow-up for the uh, CK after you start statins. How long before you, you do get a baseline so CK? I do a baseline CK. I do the first one in a month. And, and then every three months. And then you can see, okay. Yeah. And then you go off of it and you start having issues. True. Away. Yeah, but again, it has to be, again, the general rule is 20% or more increase. Okay. So if somebody, let's say, is 300 and now they've gone to 400, that's probably high. Okay. Also, um, initially presented with the interstitial lung disease, um, was unable to tolerate self-step uh, multiple medications. Um, right now, on IVIG, um, it's steroid. May I ask you? May I ask which antibody? Um, I don't have an antibody. Yeah, you need to have an. Uh, you don't have an antibody. Don't know that I have an antibody. Yeah, you, you need to. You need to make sure that your antibody has been tested. Right. right. Okay. Um, and medication next. I mean, um, so again, if if you if you have antibody associated myositis, so again, what we learned from the RIM trial, which was the the large rotoxan trial is that the individuals with dermato and polymyositis, whatever that disease is, the individuals who respond best to rotoxan are people who have antibodies. So if you have dermato and interstitial lung disease and you have, let's say, the Jovan antibody, then you should be on rotoxan. That would be the next treatment to go. And IVIG by itself? IVIG, again, I... In the doses that we use IVIG, I don't think of it as an immunosuppressive agent. It's an, it's a, it plays with the immune system, it's immunomodulatory. I, we, most of us don't think of it as suppressive, so it's not likely to put you in long-term remission, okay? Whereas a more definitive treatment where you're going after the immune cells, it may be more likely to work. Okay, so if you're developing complications such as interstitial lung disease, your treatment needs to be a little bit more aggressive than IVIG. Right, so that's why I started with the self-sufficiency. Yeah, but again, this is where rotoxan has a great track record, especially if you have antibody myositis, and that's why it, it, you, you need to have the pan, full panel of antibodies done. Thank you. And we've reached our time okay. for our session. I'm around till tomorrow. I'm sure you'll see me in the hallway somewhere. Feel free to ask me questions. Um, I'm happy to, and then my, my email is very simple. It's my last name, all smalls, at uci.edu. And so it's publicly listed. You can find me at the UC Irvine website um, on that. Feel free to drop me a line. We get a lot of inquiries from the Myositis Association and patients. Uh, Dr. Goyle, who's also here, she's my colleague. We both specialize my, in myositis, so we see a fair number of patients as well. We do a lot of trials. So if you happen to be in the Southern California region, um, it's a good resource for you. It's my last name, M-O-Z-A, F as in Frank, F as in Frank, A-R, at U-C-I dot E-D-U.
is the Myositis Association, helping patients become peers. Now for the past 25 years. So if you have been diagnosed, here's an organization to unite us. Eight thousand members they can boast. Real strange word that no one's heard, it's myositis. There's an annual patient conference, which is just second to none, where you'll learn a lot and network, and you'll also have some fun. And their website is updated with a lot of current news, with lots of info and resources, and much more that you can use, like info TMA compiles, and like lists of clinical trials, and lists of research too, you can review, cause it's all there for you. So hooray for the group DMA, it's the Myositis Association, helping patients become peers, now for the past 25 years. So if you have been diagnosed, here's an organization to unite us, a quarter century they can the group that's got the scoop on myositis.